Dr. Jeff Perry with uh, Cornell University, specifically College of Ag and Life Sciences in the Department of Global Development. I have, yeah, so I've got a, a general ag background. I grew, was, uh, grew up right outside of Cornell, spent a couple years in uh, Western Massachusetts for middle school, and then moved back to New York for a dairy farm growing up in high school. From my perspective, I, I have a little bit of a, a New York background in my parent, my, my mom and my uncle, they all live in the New York region, but yeah. my cousin lives back there too. She was into forestry and she, it's absolutely the Bible Cornell is yeah. in some things in the forestry realm. And many people think of it as the bird place, right? The ornithology department yes. is hugely well known. Yeah, the, I mean, Lab of Ornithology is internationally known. We're number one in the world for plant sciences. Uh, we've got one of the, we're also number one, at least nationally, for hotel administration. Uh, hotel, did you hotel. say hotel administration? Hotel, we have a hotel, the, the school of hotel management, it's its own college, is nationally ranked number one, specifically for hotel management. And yet yeah. nobody else gets any respect other than the bird people. Right, the, well the bird people are definitely more vocal about it, but it's funny because it's also, we've got the, the arts college, we've got a medical, real medical college. Uh, there's a law school, so there's all sorts of diversity. Ezra Cornell, our founder, said any person, any study, and we try to emulate that to this day where you can usually find elements. We've got a landscape architecture program, we've got a college of architecture. I was basically, there's six, I think there's seven colleges across the university. We're specifically College of Ag and Life Sciences. Now I get the little uh, the little uh, online notice from Cornell that tells me about the small farms programs and the educational offerings that you can that you can take classes. So yeah. you have some great stuff with that too. Yeah. So and actually the small farms program, which is part of the extension system extension program, housed at Cornell. So Cornell is the state the uh, state land grant for New York, and the extension system is very extensive. But the small farm pro farms program it was a leader in online. Uh, uh, instruction. Cornell's really been slow to absorb the online mechanisms. Small farms isn't working with students, we're working with producers out in the field and they continue to develop a very strong online profile of courses to facilitate new businesses and current businesses to, to continue to improve their expertise given the research coming out of our, our uh, professors in, in CALS. And it's not just a, it's it's large and small things because yes. they had a recent uh, they had a recent course that was coming out I believe in the last month or two that was uh, the QuickBooks and so yes. it's QuickBooks for for farm people and it really it did really started its nucleus where was very much small literally small farms but it's grown because there's so it's also grown to diverse and niche operators so the large operators have different connections that are not going to use. But a, there's a huge growth in farm to table across New York and breweries and the producers for brewer, brewers and distillers. And that's become quite a niche for the small farms program because they're not huge. And they all know, need those extra resources of QuickBooks and specialization in diversified crops and that type of thing. Yeah, and, uh, and New York is something, they, they're very much like California. So we're from California and people say, oh, it's surfing and tourism yeah, yeah. and the Navy. And that's kind of all the, the PR that you yep. get. Yep. And yet, just like New York, which is the city or nothing, everybody thinks of Big yes. Apple and that's it, but California and New York both have huge agricultural regions in them. Yeah, it's actually fun that you align those two. I think you're exactly right. The, uh, everybody thinks you're at New York City, and yet upstate, we're very competitive. We've got specialization in a broad swath of agriculture, similar to California. We have to diverse, we have a little bit of a different spin because we have a lot of winter, but We've got apple crop. We have crops like apples and and some of our fruit crops that need that cold. So we actually and maple syrup. We're number two next to Vermont and, and maple syrup. And so we really do have a huge infrastructure uh, economically that's agriculture across upstate that feeds into the city and, and actually across the world. So it's California is a great alignment where they're always kind of a, well it's L A or it's Hollywood or. or the, the primary cities, and yet there's so much growth beyond that. New York, I mean, I think New York has a little more diversity because we've got 
uh, of quite a grain growing enterprise in the west part of the state. The center of New York is basically Finger Lake, is a wine country where we've got so many lakes. We've got, and then we've, in the eastern part of the upstate, we've got Hudson Valley, which is um, uh, truck gorgeous. farming. Just stop by saying gorgeous. Uh, gorgeous. <laughs> well, the, the, I'm biased where it's all gorgeous, but uh, Hudson Valley's a lot of cabbage and onions and truck farming and a little more apples as you forget farther up, and the diversity is just absolutely outstanding. And they have it's, phenomenal farmers markets too in New York. The farmers markets has exploded, yeah, and really gained traction both in the city, but all of our small cities upstate also now have very good connections between the producers and the local uh, consumers. Yeah, now, continues to grow. now in New York, they have that. They have another thing that's in in connection with the West Coast. In that Washington State is known as the hops area yes. in this day and age, and yet New York State used to be the hops producer in North was America. The, is that yes, right? it was the hops producer. Madison County is kind of the focal point, which is just a little farther east of us, but to the true center of the state. And it really ran for a large. There was a huge number of brewers. It's much more diverse than the hops that we used to grow. Uh, and it's starting to come back. We just, Cornell just received a large grant to go back into hops breeding and research because we have 500 brewers right now across upstate New York uh, that are all independent craft brewers and they're using New York State products for a certain percentage of that. And there's a there's a there's quite an upswell in hops production. Just in the last, uh, I w I've been involved with hops production a little bit before I started teaching 10 years ago. So it's really gaining traction uh, not in huge, we, we can't compete on volume with Yakima Valley in Washington, but we've got quite a bit of diversity and there's a huge amount of interest in kind of those small uh, specialized varieties. Yeah, we, well, San Diego, so we know that the the, the microbrewers are yeah. big. It's the, Very it, big. It, it was it, well, about 10 years ago, it started to be the thing. Yep. And I know that New York State, I think it was about three years ago that they started to do these tax credits. They were really smart from a governmental perspective. Yep. And if, and if in-state breweries used in-state yes. hops, they got huge, huge and tax credits. It's both the hops and the grains. It's also really stabilized our grain. We always had a fairly decent grain production, but now we've got operators are specializing in the grains suitable to the, the producers. I mean, I've got a, my uh, uncle at home does a little bit of specialization in, in barley, special barleys and wheats, and he's just connected with a distiller, and he's now providing for that distillery because it was a, an older variety of barley that he really wanted to use. So that's continuing to, it's really created quite an interesting infrastructure for the smaller operators to connect with the small microbreweries and it just continues to grow. There's some hiccups in production and processing, but we continue to work, and Cornell really actively works. Our Agritech Research Park in Geneva continues to build, they've got food science uh, facilities and the research facilities on the crop side, so we really continue to support that continual growth of the infrastructure. Well, and this is important because New York State, and as the rest of the country, but especially New York State, um, to my mind, has gone through some major changes in the direction of its agriculture. Like everywhere else, there's been some things that have profoundly impacted them. So I know that uh, I have a relative that has a dairy farm, and yep. it was this gorgeous dairy farm that used to be in, it used to have serious production in it. But dairy farmers, especially smaller ones, are having a hard time staying alive. And I know that between the hobby farming people that come up from the city that want one of those little bedroom suburb community type things along the Hudson River Valley, or you know the, the even the people further up say all along the hudson valley corridor it's my understanding that the dairy farms have sort of changed their natures they've been bought out and so dairy farming is not quite the same thing as it was in yeah, new york state i'm not sure they're bought out so much as the farm the, the dairy is still a major production in new york state but it's consolidated it, they're still very family driven but they're large scale we've moved beyond I mean, my uncle the, the farm i grew up on or spent my high school years on went out in the buyout and it's now houses, um, it, it's simply not in dairy. But I also work with a lot of dairymen who have just grown to the point where the baseline is 1,000 to 2,000 cows or larger. Western New York, I was out there for 15 years and that's very large scale, that's 2,000 at farms and up. They're still family owned, but they're managing much larger surface areas. And it changes the dynamics of the dairy from what we used to think about. Uh, and it's, but at the same time, a lot of those older dairy farms, as you noted, have converted back into, we've now got a growing growth in beef. We've got more and more beef production. We've got a pinch point in, in processing, but more uh, farm to table interest in having local beef and having grass fed beef in the community 
and knowing where that comes from, a lot of dairy producers are now converting to beef operations. Yeah. Now, one of the big problems with producing meat is the is the USDA approved yes, slaughter facilities. It's, it's a major issue. So tell me tell me how how that works and what the issues are and what might be a solution that you could see. Well, the, 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 I know that's, that's a huge a good question. Well, there's, there. so there's interesting. So uh, as a Farm Bureau member, Farm Bureau is actively working actually at the na at the national level to increase some introduce legislation that would increase the flexibility for state inspected. Uh, processors to allow for the sale of meat. Right now it has to be USDA inspected or custom sale to an owner. There's a legislation in place where the state inspected facilities could actually allow for the sale to customers in state up to a certain volume and, and that's continuing to work through. It's, it's been introduced a few years but we get introduced it again. There's, there is active research and, and consideration of trying to increase the, the number of processors, but it's a very extensive process to go USDA. To get federally inspected, I've got some really active processors that are too busy, they don't want to take the time to be USDA inspected. There's a continual discussion about how to solve that problem, I don't, but I haven't heard any pathways that have opened up that's, that are going to be clear. It's still very, very uh, murky. And it's one we're continuing to wrestle with because it's the, the production, anybody I've talked to, we're, we're scheduling four to six months out to get an animal processed. In some, in some areas, two years. In some areas, two years. Yeah, they, ha and, they and haven't they have been to go, born yet. And, and they have still... to go farther and farther away. Yeah, I mean, that's a really tough and thing. And they're, they're frustrated. The industry, the processing industry, the custom processor I talked to are also frustrated. It's also a challenging industry to get into. There's not a young, not a lot of young individuals looking to do that. So there's a lot of challenges, but and it's obviously a pinch point because we like the local source of the products but the processing is a challenge. Yeah, well, we haven't put money in in, in certain avenues of government and infrastructure in quite a long time or that, enough. And, yes. and to be honest, with the expansion of our population, you have to expand your services that are there for public health, like inspections. And a lot of that's been on pause. I mean, I think it's been paused in the federal level. New York Agnum Marcus has been very supportive and very uh, proactive, but they're also limited in their budget constraints. So they, it's a continual balance of where we put our resources. Cornell's been very, very, uh, positively reflected. We get a fair amount of money from Ag and Markets to do the research in specific areas, but there's only so much money to go around. So it's a continual area of tension, but also everybody recognizes it's it's an area we've got to grow and improve. Yeah, that's not terribly sexy, is it? So when no. they say, we're going to do infrastructure funding, let's yeah. do food inspection. Yeah. And we have the same, yes, the food yeah. inspection is a challenge. Some of those are much more exciting, and, and that's not one. Yeah, yeah. Now, one of the things I, I, I again, People have a tendency to associate New York with one or two things. I mean, and some of them may even think about apples. The apple varieties in New York State are oh, phenomenal. Yes, Cornell's, Cornell is a linchpin of apple variety. I've got Dr. Susan Brown has spent her entire career in apple research. Is now several of the new varieties that have come out on the national national scene are from Dr. Brown's work. Uh, I'm going to blank Honeycrisp. There's a there's a Snapdragon. Several of them are really from her research across her whole career. And we're very, yeah, we're a little bit protective. We really enjoy the, the, the uh, diversity of texture and flavor that, that Cornell has in their apples. And the, the cider industry has just exploded as well. Angry Orchard's the heavy hitter. Uh, we've got Beacon Skiff, which used to be, is a family run, um, was a lot of you pick and also fresh delivery, has now converted and now 1911 cider. It's several generations in, they've just exploded. Over 50% of their production goes into their cider now, and it's distributed nationally. It's really been fun. I, I grew up near there, always intersecting, and now they're just this powerhouse of a cool uh, New York State cider. Yeah, uh, we, from being from the West Coast, we always think Washington for apples. Yeah. And yet, the New England area, it, again, with your chill in New York, I know in Nova Scotia, in that area, it's, they have huge apple festivals out there. It's very, very conducive. Yeah. Yeah. to apple growing. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah. But but again, the branching out of things that were traditionally considered a, a one area of, of a New York production uh, can move to others now. And again, I'm going to go back to the dairy. One of the things on my relative's farm is one of those big milk, the stainless steel milk uh, vats. The storage vats, storage yeah. Storage vats. Yeah. And they're using these now in some areas in the small breweries. They're converting these to use them for either microbrewery or distilling yes. or anything like that. It's oh, yeah. a perfect mix. I, isn't I just it? sold a small 300 gallon tank to my neighbor distiller. Uh, to He's got it all polished up. He was an engineer, so he designs his own equipment. 
and he's now using that in a small distillery just down the road in Marathon outside of Cornell. Yeah. So in some yeah, way, there's a lot of fun repurposing, both in terms of use of the land. I think in upstate areas, well, I think even the downstate folks, there's a lot of interest in protecting and maintaining open space and active use of class one and class two agricultural lands, but it is diversifying from our traditional use. It was heavily dairy. Now we've got a much nicer, a, a, probably an interesting blend of uses because we've got an increasing mix. I, I was really concerned, how many breweries can we handle? Well, the brewers are continuing to grow. And it's, San Diego, it's driving, you, they just keep going. Oh my gosh, it's driving <laughs> quite a strong infrastructure. Yeah. And I'm, we're excited Cornell and Cornell Agritech happens to be a hub of a lot of that research so they can continue to grow and develop new ideas and really support. We, Dr. Greg Peck in uh, School of Integrated Plant Sciences was brought in several years ago. He's a hard cider specialist. He's looking at the old varieties that used to be very common that were, were pushed away for fresh variety apples. He's now working at bringing those back and they've got so much research in the diversity of apple crop varieties, specifically for cider. It's yeah. really fun. It's well, really it's, been fun. it's great too because some of these old varieties had different characteristics that we no longer look for. Very because distinct. In all of our agriculture, we bred for trait, right? Yes. We selected for trait. So apples and tomatoes are selected to get to market, but not necessarily for their vitamin A right. or vitamin C or their ability to still taste like an apple should taste. Yeah. And this is something we've lost in many ways where yeah. somebody a hundred years ago would know what an apple tastes like, yes. and we can't translate that to people today. No, it's, and yet with science, in a way we can bring that yeah, back. It's really fun that he's really looking, I mean, I've got an old variety at my house that's really quite bitter, but he said this, sometimes that's a great mix for the ciders, and they really are, that's part of the fun across all the, in SIPS, we've got an awesome plant breeding program, and they work hard at trying to, uh, Dr. Mazurik is a, a specialist internationally known for squash and cucumbers, and, and really doing active, he gets excited about the breeding and de der derivation of heritage breeds and how to make them a little more productive at the, at the scale we want for commercialization. And he's been dynamic, he's still a relatively young professor, but has had huge success in developing new varieties. My wife started drawing one this year in our garden that was a spin-off of one of his experiments. And so that, that's part of what Cornell, we pride ourselves on is that, that connection to research and cutting edge across the entire spectrum from animal science to plant science to food science. Yeah, I, I'm just going to say, I, you need to go talk to Kerry Fowler if you don't already, because we went a couple years ago to talk to him, the Global Seed Vault yeah. in Norway. Yeah. yeah. And he his thing was squash. He had fields and fields of gorgeous squash. And he and his wife are huge philanthropists. Yeah. And um, they, they, they were doing studies on the different varieties of squash. And it seems like such a specific thing, and yet, this is how we get many of these great varieties. He's exactly right. He, he's, he's worked, I think he's worked with them, but that's what he sees is there's so much opportunity and diversity within the genetic material across that, that's the squash cultures. Yeah, it's but been, been really fun and he's yeah, so much fun to work with. Isn't the kids, he? The kids absolutely love working with him. Yeah. He's very dynamic and very excited about what he does. He's a believer and that's yeah. kind of what you need is people that have the foresight to say there's something outside of the norm. Yeah. There's just this regular yeah. thing that we've been hearing. And that's what's fun is that, you know, as, as students come to Cornell, they get the direct intersect with researchers that are passionate about what they do. You know, Dr. Marvin Fritz really specializes in strawberries and trying to extend the season of strawberries and he gets really passionate. He, he's actually the berry specialist along with uh, Dr. Courtney Weber over in Agritech and has spent their entire career developing and improving the varieties for production and flavor and now they're extending with high tunnels. How do we grow them longer seasons and they get really excited and the students get to intersect with them and start their own careers with a passion for specific areas of agriculture. Now this is a quality of life issue too because I know that one of my favorite things is to, to taste a satsuma or a Santa Rosa plum. There's yeah. just that moment where you taste it where you think like, life oh. is good and all is well in the yes. universe, right? Yeah, or, or a, just a beautiful variety of peach that's just, there's, there's, there's that moment where you say, this is what life is supposed to be yes. about. Yes. And so I could see somebody that goes to Cornell and, or, and says, I want to have this be my lifetime of study. Yes. You really, in a weird kind of way, have improved everybody's lives just yeah, by yeah. bringing, spending your life bringing back one variety. Yeah, and we do. And it's funny because we also spend a lot of time, part of, uh, part of the draw oftentimes for Cornell is the networking because we have such a deep network. Once you start that path, you start making, I've got one 
one uh, young lady who was graduated several years ago went to a, a national soils conference but made connections that has now helped her. She's now in uh, Western New York managing a large farm that really specializes in diverse uh, uh, fresh produce and really helped make connections to the specialists that help her continue to improve. Now my daughter was working for a hydroponics operation. They had a, they had a, a, a nutrition issue. She called up Dr. Van Ness in her soils class and they solved the problem. They worked through his, his expertise, helped her work with her boss and they figured out what the issue was and correct it because she had a connection back to the research. So I mean, it, it's continually an impressive, the continued growth of the network of the students as they go through and find their passion but they realize they can lean out into a broader network of, of experts. And these farms in, in New York State, New England, Connecticut, Vermont, all the rest of these places, yeah. as coming from California, you can go to farm stands and see certain things. But oh, one of sure. the things that struck me, we were, in, um, we were in the Vermont region, and we were coming back and we stopped at a farm stand. I needed half and half, and I got to pick up a bottle of half and half from a farm stand. I thought, okay, are they doing something illegal? Am I kind of encouraging them? It, it is, you're, it's all right to do that, so you yeah. get all of these amazing tastes by driving through the New England countryside. Yeah, we've got a, Trinity Valley is a local producer. He's only 60 or 70 cows. They're now, they just put in robot milkers. So they invested about a million dollars in robot milkers. It's only 70 cows. They produce, all their milk goes into Trinity Valley Farms, uh, cream line milk. So it's, it's um, not homogenized. So it floats, the cream floats to the surface. Delicious. The <laughs> chocolate is, milk is the best I've ever had. They're gaining continual ground because it's unique and it's a high quality product. They make their own half and half, they're making their own cheese curds. They've developed a little agritourism niche and it's been very, very successful. Now, part of the family, the, the gentleman that, that came into the family was a marketing specialist and the original, uh, the Poole family, it's second generation, well, the, the daughter that I know of that's now running this, I don't know how many generations deep it is, it was a perfect mix. They were able to invest the money and it's just taken off with high quality, high value product. It's not the same old traditional um, stuff that you find in gallon jugs in a grocery store. There's just a little different flavor. The textures are different. You know, Chobani yogurt is one of those I get here and it's just kind of traditional yogurt. I'm now addicted to Greek Chobani yogurt made in New Berlin, New York. That just has a different taste to it. Yeah, different yeah. taste. So wait, this is kind of an interesting thing. We have a tendency to think of the sciences. You know, if you're going to be in a lab and you're going to be inside, you're going to do all of this. You're going to do GMO and you're going to do manipulation of things. But in many ways, at a place like Cornell, you have people that are just doing nothing but bringing back yes. old school there, genetics. There's a huge, yes, there's a, there's a strong, I mean, we still do a lot of that new cutting edge genetic, genetic work and continuing to push the edge of that. But at the same time, and actually I think that's been within the last 15 years, a continual re-emphasis of let's reach back into our history and try to bring those historical strengths that we've lost through uh, commercialization and large scale production. We want to we want to break that down a bit and have some more specialization. And we're having researchers really specialize that. You're right. And that's across animals and animal genetics, all the way across into plant and plant genetics. It goes into food science. You now we the food science has been very uh, cutting edge commercialization, but now they have a viticulture, enology, and brewing perspective that's exploded. Where I've got students that are, I just read a, one of our newest newsletters, they were developing a new beer. You now the students were getting to craft a new type of flavored beer that wasn't around 10 years ago. They didn't have a program. So they've been, Cornell's been very adaptive in finding those new cutting edges that sometimes lean back on history. Well, this works perfectly with your restaurant uh, connection, it does, doesn't it? And that the connection to hotel schools. For now, we had a wines course in the hotel school. We now have a wines and vines course in SIPS. And we have students that really intersect. We'll have hotel students come over to Cal's to take that specific wines and vines course with a little more background in the production of grapes. And you managed to put agritourism in the connection to New York State as well, because it's, yes. it's, that's a Huge well. piece, yeah. huge piece. Yeah. It's, it's just a, and, and that's just, it's a little bit niche, but at the same time, if you can find that right target, it explodes. You know, Trinity Valley adds the corn maze. It's a lot of work, but they have so many people flock. They just create an event. I've got, there's several folks across the state that have created these event centers. Just, it, may, it might be seasonal, and yet everybody flocks there because they know, ooh, we're gonna go here for a day, have a blast, and the product continues to, and it's to an be experience. very productive. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so now tell me, we've got this big sign here, now that I've kind of picked your brain about yeah, Cornell, because yeah. I could talk to you for, 
days about that kind of thing. <laughs> Poor man. But the Cornell CALS, it's the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. Yes. And the, the, the thing that you have here on your banner is Veterinary Science 9 through 12, the classroom curriculum. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, so uh, within, so College of Ag and Life Sciences, as we talked about, really kind of covered the broad spectrum of research and development in agriculture. Within that, we received a grant. Um, the, there was a College of Education at Cornell that, that was dissolved in 2013. Uh, the, group, the students I have here are actually graduate students cross, they're taking a course at Cornell, but they're also at Ithaca College for agricultural education. We've got uh, over 300 teachers in high schools across New York State that are certified K through 12. We developed a uh, vet tech curriculum. There was initial curriculum back 15 years ago, maybe 20 years ago. Uh, we, this is about four years old. We got a large USDA grant to bring in 12, uh, 10 or 12 vets from around the country. They identified all the key pieces currently in veterinary science. We then handed this off to a team of teachers in the state and they developed, it ends up being a two year long curriculum specializing in veterinary science at the high school level. So it's getting the students exposed to the, the intricate details within vet science. A lot of those students aren't gonna be vets. They may go into the animal industry, they may go into pet grooming, but they get to understand all the intricate details of reproduction, of nutrition, of safety and uh, animal well-being through this curriculum. And we've been able to basically, we, we bring that here because the teachers, it's, a, it's purchased at basically at cost and it's an automatic download. We have a great response from teachers across the country. Cornell doesn't typically build curriculum anymore. The curriculum system was, was disbanded about 10 years ago, but it's a really great opportunity to use the expertise from the Cornell Vet School and their connections to vet, to vet schools across the country to update what we thought was important in veterinary science just as an introductory element. I mean, the students are really getting, they aren't getting a certification, but they're getting strong exposure so they, go, they could go to vet tech. They could go ahead and aim for a four-year degree in animal science somewhere across the country and then go to a vet school. And it's a really great precursor because a lot of students like animals as a focus area for their interest in ag. A lot of the students here, if you ask, they're either livestock driven or vet science driven. Yeah, so I, this, this, I would assume this display is almost more for the advisors that bring the kids. That particular one is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah the rest like of great. these really uh, are, are very much driven towards trying to get the students attracted to, ooh, that sounds interesting. That one is specifically yeah. for advisors. I mean, the students will come in and ask questions, and when we first rolled this out, we had the students go ask their advisors to come in. And we had some example demonstra uh, elements. Now this year, it's been fun. I've got so many people using it. They're coming back and commenting how much they like it and asking questions about revisions, which is great because now it's positioned us where we can, in the next couple of years, we'll work on a, sm a small revision just to polish up and, and slightly improve that version. Yeah. But it's been a good, it's been a strong success. I know, and it's much needed. I, I'll tell you right now, I know how expensive it is to put yes. those particular and things And it's still out. a very active, yes. I mean, curriculum is huge. It's a, it's a bit of a beast. That's why we don't do it quite as often because it is quite a process to develop, but the, it's been a high demand for that level of content in the veterinary sciences because it was very current. It's the most current one out. And we've had really positive response because a lot of students, that's their, they think of vets. When you think of agriculture and animals, they, they think of vet science. This one would allow them to explore the broader range of animal science because there's so much in nutrition and physiology and genetics in the animal field not to mention going back to heritage breeds. I raise heritage hogs, I've got some folks doing heritage sheep, and there's a, there's a resurgence of bringing those older genetics back in. And sometimes vet science exposes those students to the awareness of, wait, I'd like to go work on genetics in heritage breed, so it opens up that pathway for yep. students. Yeah, it's a fascinating thing. There, it's, there's it's exciting. So many it's a, one of the reasons I was a teacher for so long is all these fields are so exciting, you can get students excited about them and start them on a path for a career. You know, to have them come back and realize they've been in the industry for 10 years and, and really are excited about what they've chosen to do. So if, if I find this interesting, is this something that I as a citizen can go in and look at or do I have to be a teacher or do I have to find a teacher that might be willing to allow me in this? No, no, it's actually, so it's available through the, um, the uh, Cornell store and it's, a, it's I've got homeschoolers that have purchased this or are using it as a homeschool supplement for the high school kids. So it's, you know, it, it's, it's not like it's blocked for certified teachers only. I mean, it's a resource for anybody that's interested in animal science and vet science specifically. Yeah, it's a purchasable curriculum. I've had students, I've had uh, homeschoolers contact and ask, 
and I've had a couple that have downloaded it and are using it to supplement what they were already using. So it's available to anybody that wanted, if you just really want some good bedtime reading in vet science, this would be a cool, it downloads as a PDF and a Word document, but it's available to anybody. And it's really written, it's written by teachers, so there's activities that are very applicable, but it's written such that we're assuming not, there's so much content, the ag teachers aren't gonna have all that knowledge. They have to have a little bit of backstory in there so they understand what they're teaching. But it would be available for anybody through the Cornell store. Yeah, I, I, that is bedtime reading for some of us. But of course, yeah, yeah. I, you know, I know oh, it's box salute and the yep, whole thing yep. too. My so father-in-law always has a list of exciting interests, topics <laughs> he wants to reach. Uh, he's, he's always reaching into new areas of, of in, experimentation and, and uh, interest. If people want to find out more about this and they're listening, where would you send them? Yeah, so we've the. So Cornell has, actually Cornell University, if you just go to cornell.edu, that's going to give you the, uh, the entry portal for the full university. And then in there, the, the College of Ag and Life Sciences, or CALS, has, it, it would be the next layer, it has its own newly designed website that has in, information on all of our majors. And then within each major, it breaks down graduate school. I've got, we've got awesome graduate programs for anybody that wants to come in and do research related to those fields or undergraduate studies. Uh, and the website, I can honestly say, we finally got a really positive, dynamic website that's relatively uh, straightforward to find information. And I always encourage people that are interested, dig down through and look at the faculty and find faculty that are really in, in your field of interest. Don't be afraid to reach out and ask, invite with an email, just say, hey, I'm interested in a little more detail, and they'll point you in a direction for further research or share literature that they're working with. But, yep, or sign up for the Small Farms Newsletter. Or, that or sign up for the Small Farms Newsletter, which is a more a quarterly connection. And there's a, there's several different newsletters, although I, I guess most of my, the Cornell Chronicle, I don't know if that's available outside of alumni, um, but they're, they're posted on the cornell.edu website. Yep, entry access to everything that we do. And we, we're getting better as a university of being much more visible and having access to things for anybody that wants to track that information down. No, very, very prestigious university in the in the animal world, whether it be yes. whether it be the the veterinary science for high school or the Eagle Cam, which I have to really I tell you I enjoy too. So ornithology, I'll, I'll just put a shout out. Yeah, to yeah, no, it's well. it's the and it's extremely diverse. All, sometimes it, it gets so diverse you lose track of how many excellent things are going on. Yeah. But there's a there's a they, we continually strive for excellence in whatever we do and continuing to be international in our focus and kind of driving the, the new experiences and new ideas, even if it means connecting back to our history. Yeah, it's, and it's very obvious. Well, thank you so much well, for taking the time. Well, thank you very, very much for inviting. It. it was a pleasure to talk to you. Wonderful.